I should start. I, um, I, I want you to go back to, um, just very shortly, um, to our great mentor, tutor, friend, Elamir Honkish, who raised this issue in his last article. Um, he wrote in 2014 a short review in Ipsa Bachag and, and suggested that there was something um, unclear, ambiguous also, about Europa's relationship to the white bull. So it was rather a wild um, <coughs> affair uh, than just a rape. Um, and many of the images show this. And, and he suggested that the, the Minotaur might be, and I don't know, I'm not in ancient Greek history, but probably, or one of the versions of the myth says that Minot the Minotaur was related to um, Europa, probably her grandchild. And he, she, he went further with a very, how to say it, he knew that he doesn't have much um, time. So it, it was a very profound article in some of his last speeches. He um, suggested that um, um, the beautiful queen, the Phoenician queen Europa, uh, has certain features on her face which re might remind us on a monster's features. So we, we have to be careful. That, that was the warning. Um, but if you, if you study this map, this is very, very interesting. It's from 1544. A German cartographer, Sebastian Münster, uh, did it. And it's, it was, yeah, 500 years ago. It's interesting to see how different we looked. Um, yeah, just a, just Moscovia was not very important at that time. Um, Hispania was quite big, but England, Anglia, not, not that important, and so on and so forth. So that is another discussion topic, not maybe for today, but how much our perception of Europe, of Europe, have changed during these last centuries now. Here, I got a book from, from Jody, where, uh, which, which impressed me so much that I started to think about the very famous words of um, President Lincoln, who in the most desperate moments of the American Civil War, when it was just bloodshed and, 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 and suffering and desperation, and innocent people and children were killed, and as a president, he knew that it is going to lead to absolute uncurable catastrophes. So um, what he said, <coughs> to the entire nation, people from the South and the North. We are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies, though passion may have strain, it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic chords of memory will swell when again touched, as surely they will be, by the better angels of our nature. Can, can you remember how desperate he was that he could, as a president calling for the, the better angels of a nature to come out and help people to understand that they are just one, one, one nation, one society. And about a um, hundred years later, these days in November 4th, um, after the Hungarian Revolution, at the moment when the Hungarian Revolution was clamped down, some of the Western intellectuals, not, not too many, they woke up. The time um, Western Europe was very much captured by the idea of communism. So very many sympathizers with the Soviet Union, Jean, uh, uh, Sartre, um, <clears throat> and many intellectuals believed that there might be some problems there, but still, you know, this is where we should go. And some woke up, like Albert Camus and Han Arendt and others, he said, in Europe's isolation today, we have only one way of being true to Hungary, and that is never to betray among ourselves or anywhere what the Hungarian heroes died for. Never to condone among ourselves or anywhere, even indirectly, those who killed them. It would indeed be difficult for us to be worthy of such sacrifices, but we can try to be so in uniting Europe at last, in forgetting 
our quarrels, in correcting our own errors, in increasing our creativeness and our solidarity. Uh, sorry. So this is the book um, by John Meacham. And uh, so what, what, what is today? What are we facing today in, in Europe? What is, what is the problem? If you look at the statistics, um, Eurobarometer, um, Pew, the very, very fresh statistics, it says that well, it's not much problem. Europeans like the EU. They like the fact that they are together and they see the benefits the countries are getting from EU membership. There are a lot of, lot of positive things you can, you can, um, you can get from the statistics. Um, country membership has been a good thing. The economic integration of Europe has strengthened the country's economy. Um, most Europeans, of course, support democratic values, mostly positive attitudes toward the EU. Life satisfaction is up significantly over the past three decades. Uh, Europeans are both hopeful and a little apprehensive about the future. Uh, Europeans are most optimistic about their cultural relations with other European nations. And as a matter of fact, we do have, um, as we did um, in the 80s, I'm going to talk about this more uh, in details, of movements. The European movement uh, was famous, in, you know, established after the Second World War. I don't go into details. Um, they're still alive, and, and they, they try to catch, for example, ourselves, and they try to revitalize themselves, and, and so on and so forth. We participated in the New, New Europeans, organized by Frank Bianchieri, who believed that it's a time to create an old European party uh, for the European Parliament to break through that democracy will be born if an, um, a, a political configuration will be directly elected. That means that you here in Hungary can, elect, can vote for someone in France, etc. So you, you just um, jump over on the national um, uh, constituency game. It, it died, but it, it was a very heroic attempt. And so on as DM25, led by um, Janusz Varoufakis, uh, quite um, lively every second week. I get a, a nice newsletter from them and, 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 and a request to pay uh, to, 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 for, to donate. That is, it seems to be very important for them, but it's, um, they, they are alive. Um, Volta, Volta Europa and Agora Europe, Agora was mentioned, um, the European Alliance for People, and, and that's, that's, that's an important one, I think, a very interesting one, uh, mostly, um, mostly organized by, I think, conservatives, Christian Democrats, but not necessarily and only, a soul for Europe. So the recognition that Europe does not have a soul so I can relate it to the lack of angels, maybe dormant angels. And that was established, I think, 15 years ago and more or more. And people from this room, um, Bella, Jody, myself, I'm sure others too, we were invited several times to a Soul for Europe meetings. Beautifully organized, very elegant people, young and, and more senior ones, artists. Um, clergymen and in Istanbul, in Amsterdam, in, in Berlin, <clears throat> um, talking about that something is missing. Hmm? We would need a soul. Um, and then there's a very, very many times repeated um, mantra, or quote unquote pseudo self criticism that we should have started with culture. If we can start again, um, some of the um, Founding fathers supposed to say, nobody can find this quotation. Huh? But this is Jean Monnet probably said somewhere, nobody can find it in, in any of the literature. If we could start again, we should start with culture. What does it mean? So this means that that that, that kind of <clears throat> cold project that the EU integration became is unable to bring people together and create a larger community. In other words, if you translate to this metaphoric language, Europe does not have a soul. And as Ralph Darendorf very famously said once, you cannot fall in love with a great market. Yeah? That's, that's the same. It's true. Oh, welcome. It's good, good that you came. I was referring to you. So, 
Uh, so what is wrong? We have the movements, self-awareness, self-reflection, people are quite happy to have the EU. So when some, some crazy intellectuals like myself or our group here is always complaining about problems. What is wrong? Um, but if you dig deeper uh, a little bit, you find out that nobody is satisfied with democracy. Democracy is in a big, big crisis. Um, and you don't have time here to mention all the literature. It's, we started to write political scientists, sociologists, about it in the last 15, maybe 20 years, 15 years. One of the most famous representatives of this group is Philip Schmitter, who, who gave several lectures here and in Kursag, and many times um, mentioned it was never really seriously discussed the problem of no choice democracies. We do have the democratic mechanisms and institutions in our EU 28 countries. Um, they function more, more or less quite well. Uh, <clears throat> there are differences, of course, in newcomers, in new democracies, etc. Um, but um, there are a lot of important issues. These democracies, nation state democracies, cannot um, say anything about. Their scope and size and scale is not. not um, architectured for that. And that means that we, again, we live in the times of paradoxes. Yeah? We always did. It was, I mean, a notion, a, a concept in social sciences is always itself and something else. We always say Europe is, and is equal with Europe and non-Europe. Hmm? Democracy is always <clears throat> democracy and non-democracy. So it's always, always, but the problem comes when the non-part is getting bigger. And democracy reminds you more on non-democracy or almost anti-democracy. What happened is that what all these categories which were kind of fit um, in the post-Second World War period lost their grasp, lost their capability to describe um, reality. And we still use them. That was one of the issues, <clears throat> uh, Albrecht, you raised, and yeah, that we, uh, we live in a categorical crisis. Our categories in social sciences and then in politics simp are simply inadequate. And here in I ask, we try, we try, we try, we talk about this in the last five, six years. I'm not, I'm not sure if we did achieve too much. Yes, thank you very much. I did, we did, I don't think so. Um, to create a new, um, more proper category, but for that, very reason, we are flirting with natural sciences, um, quantum uh, physics, um, complexity theory, and some of the notions are quite applicable, but this is a, another debate, it's not for today. Uh, <clears throat> um, one of the symptoms but what we are facing today, that one of the mega tendencies, is, is in a paradox. So we are living in a time of paradoxes. The, in the moment when we had the feeling that the European integration was very successful, uh, and that was seen uh, by um, the well-established democracies uh, the, the same way, um, a counter-paradigm got stronger. The paradigm of the nation-state. Because we were not successful in finding the methods, democratic, etc., to create the demos and, and the polity accordingly on the supra or transnational level, the very success of the integration, and we cannot go into details why this success happened, uh, became the success of the strongest nation states, whom nobody could control. And it's not, I'm not starting G Germany bashing, just a little bit, but not much. Uh, but, but because this is not, her fault that Germany is the strongest, biggest, economic, most capable, and if you have the, the interplay of the nation states, and no other players yeah, in the room, then that it, that's it. But it was not really understood, and when the crisis came, so it's jumping from after 2008, when the weaknesses of the EU integration were revealed, um, we, got, we got more bilateralism and, as a consequence, scapegoating. The North was blaming the, the South, East-West divide was, um, was widened, um, but Attila Pok here is, who is with, with us, he's an expert 
of, of um, European uh, scapegoating. So the whole book about it, which I'm not going to tell you too much, but he will probably. But he also says that Hungarian is probably best. If there, the, the, there is a competition, if there would be a competition, maybe Hungarians would won. And well, um, but that's, that's what's happening all around, um, all around um, um, the migration crisis. It's like a parody. If you read the reports, they started to, they started to blame Hungary, small and and then they did the same. And then they were blamed by others that it was just going on and on. Why? Because there is no common European vision about how to deal with this kind of mega trends, mega problems. But migration is one of them. It's, you will talk about I know about climate change and all the interrelatedness among these mega trends. And then if the nation state is the last resort to decide to give, to give answers. But I did my best. We defend the boundaries of Europe, not like the others there. Hmm? But I don't, I don't want to continue this, this the, the, the populist mantra. You all know that. So just again a metaphor. Um, <clears throat> In 2013, just to where we are with this blaming each other, scapegoating, etc. Um, you know, it's a good tradition in, in the Bundestag. You you can uh, question the chancellor, um, open questions, and sh and he or she is giving answers a little later. So there was a question in 2013 to Angela Merkel from someone I don't know, Peter Steinbrück from SPD. So what to do, I mean, this is a very old, so what to do now with the Hungarians? Yeah? Um, and, and he kind of kindly suggested that we should kick them out after a while if they don't behave. 2013, yes? No. And then uh, Angela Merkel said that we don't always need to send in the cavalry straight away. I mean, military troops. Hungary helped us a lot. What an argument, yeah? It's completely nation state. German, in German reunification, and we will never forget it. So how comes that even Germany is the strongest uh, member state? So what, is it, what kind of an argument is that? Because Hungary is, helped Germany to reunify. Again, it's a completely nationalistic way of thinking, nation state way of thinking. Then we should not kick them out yet. But, this is it. If these tendencies continue, and she pointed out anti-Semitism, hmm, then we should reconsider this. Now, um, then Viktor Orban uh, uh, made a comment about it. So she said that the Germans have already sent their cavalry to Hungary. They came in form of tanks. Please don't send them. That wasn't a good idea. It didn't work. Of course, it's a, you can say it's a populist mantra, but um, I think it was quite um, adequate. Um, and then the Hungarian liberal press said Orban again uh, calls um, uh, Angela or Germany Nazi. That was the, so in that kind of non-dialogue, you just, just beat the other one. Yeah? There's absolutely no space for any mutual understanding. No question. No questions are raised. And that goes on and on. And at the same time, the, 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 the kind of metaphoric title of this talk was Angels and Demons. We have also sometimes angels coming out from our politicians. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, Angela and Victor met uh, not, not so far from Kerseg in Chopron. There is a political kitsch called the Pan-European Picnic. We can talk about this. Uh, the fact was that people were let out, uh, East Germans, around Chopron, and the whole world remembers that, which is a lot of nonsense, isn't it? So this is how East German friends looked um, when they really, indeed, had, had a pan-European picnic, and this is today. Uh, <clears throat> um, absolute agreement and love, and it looks like two angels are talking to each other. Um, but my, my fear is that our better angels will remain mute, paralyzed, hiding somewhere for the past 30 years if we don't find them, if we are not having any 
chance or, or means or words to, to call them. And they would and not start a structured, civilized dialogue about the uh, European past, present, and future. Those angels will not arise again. 